Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eugene. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon to uh, people who are uh, east to us, and good uh, morning to the people on west of us. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Eugene for this kind introduction, um, and uh, I would like to welcome everybody to the 10th edition of the uh, our neonatology conference. Also, I would like to thank uh, MENA conferences for a uh, really great um, organization as usual in this 10th edition. Um, uh, we will have uh, a lot of uh, exciting uh, topics uh, going to be uh, uh, um, discussed during this uh, three years, uh, three days of conference. And uh, I would like to start with uh, introducing the keynote speaker. Uh, is well known to everybody, Professor Paolo Manzoni, uh, colleague and a friend. It's an honor to introduce him. Uh, we is uh, well known all over the world, and he's uh, uh, you know give great presentations. Um, Dr. Uh, Manzoni is a professor of pediatrics and head department of maternal and neonatal infant medicine in Degli in Fermi University. I hope I didn't mutilate the names that much. <laughs> uh, that's in Biela, Italy. Uh, we came to know from his great uh, conferences in Turin, Italy that we missed this year, but we uh, virtually were able to join. Uh, Dr. Manzoni is a uh, specialized in pediatric uh, at the University of Torino uh, School of Medicine. And he is on board of directors for Italian Society for Neonatology. His primary research interests include pediatric neonatal infection disease, fungal infections, prevention, RSV related diseases. He's an author of approximately 150 research articles published in peer reviewed journals, uh, an Italian and international medical journal. And he's editor, associate editor of a number of peer reviewed leading international journals. Uh, Professor Manzoni will uh, illuminate us about uh, the topic of the hour. Uh, something that we spent so much time this year discussing, and it's a really hot topic. And uh, we would like to welcome him and listen to uh, his knowledge and experience about neonatal COVID state of the art. Uh, please uh, join me, welcome Dr. Manzoni. Dr. Manzoni, all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ayman. Thank you very much, uh, Junaid. Uh, it's my utmost pleasure to be to be there, although virtually I've been attending and lecturing at the previous conferences in Abu Dhabi, organized by the, the two prominent uh, uh, chairs, and uh, it was always a pleasure to be there and to interact. This time uh, we'll have to go through virtual. I hope uh, we'll uh, be able to enjoy the education and uh, not to miss too much the interaction, but Nonetheless, uh, we hope that next year uh, this situation will be over. And uh, of course, I'm sharing my slides here. Okay. Um, my task today is to give a, an overview about uh, neonatal COVID, the state of the art. I will uh, try to summarize uh, all uh, areas that has been debated, that have been debated in COVID-19 uh, in uh, the neonatal community. Uh, please uh, be aware that this information is uh, accurate and current, but since the situation is rapidly evolving, COVID-19 might change over the next weeks and this information might be out of time and out of date already shortly. But as a matter of fact, today we'll try to uh, make the point on what we know uh, as of today. And the first point to clarify is to start from the pregnant mothers and to understand which is the actual prevalence the actual incidence rate of COVID-19 in pregnant mothers delivering. We get a great help from this New England Journal of Medicine paper in April in New York. All pregnant mothers showing up for delivery in a large academic setting were tested 
and out of 20, out of 215 pregnant women, uh, some 15% of them were COVID positive. But please note, only 1.9% of those mothers were actually symptomatic. Therefore, the risk is to underestimate the actual COVID-19 positivity in women delivering. This may be extremely impactful on our strategies and policies. Therefore, I need always to caution our obstetricians and more generally all our fellow colleagues neonatologists to make sure that a widespread and routinary test for COVID-19 be done in all pregnant mothers showing up for delivery. This is true also keeping in mind that uh, during pregnancy and uh, during the perinatal period, luckily so far COVID-19 looks not being more aggressive than it is described in other categories of patients. This is a very brand new paper from Figueiro Filho. It will be published in Journal of Perinatal Medicine short, shortly. And it's a systematic review of all studies reporting on COVID-19 during pregnancy and assessing the perinatal outcomes. It's including 11,000 cases from 15 countries up to the end of July. And as a matter of fact, the overall results show that the maternal characteristics, clinical symptoms, maternal and neonatal outcomes are actually not worse or not different from those occurring in the general population. So in mind, we can assume that the course and the onset of this infection should not be different or more dramatic during pregnancy and therefore we can have a management of pregnant mothers that does not require extreme decisions or very aggressive decisions. With this background information, let's try to give an answer to the two main issues, to two main pending questions about COVID-19 and pregnancy. The first one is, can COVID-19 be passed from a pregnant woman to the fetus or to the newborn? The answer, unfortunately, is not conclusive. So far, we don't, do not know at this time if COVID-19 can actually be passed from mother to newborn via vertical transmission. We still don't know because of many aspects are not sufficiently elucidated or investigated. Let's keep in mind that in order to have a demonstration of vertical transmission, we need to have a positive test from the mother, we need to have a positive test from the placenta or from the amniotic fluid, we need to have a positive test in the newborn, and finally we need also to have a feature of disease attributable to COVID-19 in the newborn. Also, we don't know at this time if COVID-19 acquired during pregnancy can be harmful for the baby. So the baby and the fetus are probably not hurt, at least as of we know today, by the inf infection acquired by the mother during pregnancy. However, these, the outcomes of uh, offsprings from COVID-19 infected mothers are still not accurately clear in order to rule out ultimately that this uh, situation may occur. Let's uh, try to tackle uh, a little more the point of vertical transmission versus acquired. In this cartoon that comes from a very nice review that we published in April with the Canadian colleagues, we tried to uh, summarize the main 
points that include and involve COVID-19, vertical passage, and maternal and fetal neonatal status of immunity and infection versus COVID-19. The point of vertical transmission, as I was already alluding, requires detection of COVID-19 in amniotic fluid, in cold blood and in placentas. With these findings, the theoretical risk of intrauterine infection is biologically plausible. However, so far, only very few, I would dare to say one study has comprehensively included all this information when assessing a possible transmission from mother to fetus via vertical transmission. It's just to sum up, to place a diagnosis of vertical transmission, we require to have detection of the virus in amniotic fluid and placenta from the maternal side. But from the neonatal side, we need to have a virus demonstrated in cold blood in respiratory secretions. And finally, just as I was saying, we need to have a neonatal disease attributable to COVID-19. And so far, it's very difficult to show or to support the view that a neonatal COVID-19 specific disease is described in neonates. We have concluded and published a very comprehensive review this is the paper from the Italian group of neonatal infections from the Neonatal Society of Neonatology of Italy. Um, we have listed here all the studies we, that might support a possible vertical transmission of COVID-19. However, please note in the fifth column that the positive cord blood samples either were not taken or gave in one case a negative result. So it's very difficult to confirm a vertical transmission if we don't have a demonstration of the virus in the cord blood. In contrast, the number of studies that discard a vertical transmission for COVID-19 is much larger, as you can see here. And every time, every time this test was performed, cord blood samples gave negative results for uh, COVID-19. However, we do have an actual case of confirmed COVID-19 transmission, vertical transmission. This has been published in Nature by the group of Daniel De Luca in Paris, France. This is the case, a mother delivering a, a late premature infant with pathological fetal heart tracing. Uh, APCAR score was not well, but requiring only ventilator support for six hours. However, on day third, the neurological symptoms had their onset with an MRI showing a pathological series of findings, despite the CSF was repeatedly negative. No cultures turned out to be positive for any pathogens, but for COVID-19. The baby, however, recovered slowly with no treatment. At two months of follow-up, the baby is still well and improving. What characterize, um, sorry, 
What is unique from this report is the series of samples that had been taken and that consistently and comprehensively confirm the vertical transmission. Take a look at this picture. From the maternal side, we have positivity in the nasopharyngeal swab, in the vaginal swab, in the placenta, in the amniotic fluid, and in the blood. And at the neonatal side, we have a positivity in blood, in nasopharyngeal swabs performed at day of life one, three and 18, and also positivity in rectal swab. So we may conclude, and I would dare to say, we cannot but conclude in that this was actually a vertical transmission case. But once more, if you think to a vertical transmission, you need to stick to all these list of samples to be taken and tested to be performed. Otherwise, you cannot confirm a vertical transmission. Therefore, at the moment, obstetricians and gynecologists agree on the fact that the vertical transmission of COVID-19, despite being occasional and rare, cannot be ruled out. It's our task to try to demonstrate or to investigate the existence of a vertical transmission by performing all these microbiological tests that I've been showing to you. With this in mind, let's skip to the next point, which are the specific characteristics, if any, of COVID-19 in neonates? Well, in March, at the beginning of the pandemic, with the Brazilian Society of Neonatology and Pediatrics, we published a paper, an editorial, where we were saying that we do not know exactly at this time whether COVID-19 can affect the health of the baby after birth. We stated that COVID-19 infected neonates looked mostly asymptomatic and that only a minority of neonates was showing mild respiratory distress, instability, sepsis-like symptoms, but all these features were likely attributable to concomitant conditions such as prematurity. Well, I'm happy, let's say, to tell you that in September 2020, this comprehensive systematic review went out. It was published in the Archives of Disease of Childhood Fetal Neonatal Edition with the group of Padova, led by Daniele Trevisanuto and Eugenio Baraldi, authoring this paper. And I'm happy to tell you that our uh, sentences in March can be fully confirmed in September. The most recent and updated review on neonatal COVID-19 confirms that only mild to moderate disease or asymptomatic conditions occur in neonates. And let's take a look at this systematic review. You see some 25 included studies with a comprehensive case series from 15 countries. Uh, in the right pictures, you can see diagnosis and, and demographics characteristics of the neonates. But what's important, the, these pictures show the clinical characteristics. We can conclude that symptoms occurred in two thirds of neonates at the median 10 days of life with commonly represented features in fever, gastrointestinal symptoms, hypoxia and cough in a minority of cases. However, please note that 75% of positive neonates were managed in spontaneous breathing in room air. This means that, practically speaking, no disease was there, no respiratory distress was there. Only 25-30% of them had mild respiratory distress 
feeding instability. But the majority of them, if not all, are discharged after 10 days of life in good conditions and with no need of additional management or treatment. So with this in mind, we can conclude that COVID-19 in neonates, if is there, is actually mild or to, uh, or to, or at least moderate. However, we have a number of implications for practice that we need to take into account. Even though the disease is mild or not existing, implications for practice include in the nurseries a number of actions, starting from the approach in the delivery room, starting from the algorithm or test to perform and the management of the need. Uh, we include decisions, critical decisions on cohorting, on breastfeeding, on skin-to-skin -skin contact, on ruminine, on feeding regimens, how to organize discharge and follow up and how to organize the step. So I will pick up some of this point in this last part of my talk. This is an editorial published in Frontiers of Pediatrics in April. And as you see, these two tables displayed what could have been the impact of the pandemic on the neonatal community and neonatal practices. Especially if you take a look at the right yellow table, potential family-centered care changes, and you go through what could have been recommended, it's dramatic. We could have been recommending no breastfeeding, no skin-to-skin -skin contact, no parent involvement in infant care, uh, only one parent admitted, no visits for other caregivers, caregivers difficulty in triage, in uh, physical and mental exhaustion, so, as a matter of fact, dramatic changes in the management of our needs. But now, after a few months from the beginning of the pandemic, we may reassure the neonatal community. Luckily, we had no such a hard impact and we were not forced to take most of such dramatic possible decisions. In fact, this is what we agreed on. This is the uh, strategies published in Padova in Northern Italy with a number of actions that at the same time secure safety for the caregivers, the parents and the neonates, but on the other side, maintain or reinforce all the family-centered care uh, approaches that have been demonstrated extremely useful to have a smooth and positive course of the perinatal period. Starting from the living room, because we need to have a practical approach and we need to know which actions we have to implement, which tools and which precautions we have to take into account, uh, starting from suction, from aerosolization and management of possible aerosolization moments, and continuing with the equipment used for resuscitation and ventilation. I uh, leave you and I want to address you to these two editorials and reviews that we wrote in a few months ago where all these steps are fully explained and detailed. Only some modifications are described and are deemed as necessary. But once more, the message is that any strategy in such neonates needs to be tailored to the individual patient rather than to the disease. This is something that as neonatologists, 
currently make. This is an approach that we have always had and we feel like recommending this approach also in this situation. As for breastfeeding, I will take all this issue in the next talk in one hour, but keep in mind that after some exigent moment in the first weeks of the pandemic, the majority, if not all, neonatal and perinatal societies in the world agreed on the use of uh, recommendations that including, included uh, recommendation of uh, breastfeeding, recommendation of skin-to-skin -skin contact, and implementation of preventive measures for mother neonate postnatal transmission. This is uh, extremely true, also keeping in mind that breastfeeding is the most powerful way to decrease the burden of respiratory viral infections in the first months of life. We showed clearly this issue with this uh, Italian Society of Neonatology article some years ago. Let's keep in mind that lactoferrin is uh, very important in preventing all respiratory disorders uh, attributable to viruses or other pathogens in the first year of life. And let's keep in mind that lactoferrin might act as a specific protective natural barrier against COVID-19. This is important to know because lactoferrin in vitro localizes to the cell membrane and targets and inhibits a glycoprotein called heparin sulfate protoglycan, HSPG. This is a protein that is, acts as a cell entry protein critical for cell entry by all SARS pseudoviruses, including coronaviruses COVID-19 because this protein carries the virus to the high affinity entry sites, such as the AC2. Therefore, lactoferrin in vitro blocks the entry of the cell of the viral, uh, sorry, blocks the entry of the viral agent to the cell thanks to a pathway that is independent from AC2. And also the final uh, remark, when you have a positive neonate in your unit, there are implications for discharge and follow-up because uh, persistence and shedding of the virus in the respiratory tract is 11 days, but in the gastrointestinal tract is 24 days. So this means that this baby is shedding and disseminating viruses for almost one month of life. And this has very important implications both for the world and for the neonatal follow-up in the family. And my final point, all this pandemic issue is having a great impact also on caregivers. This is a survey conducted in Italy uh, among neonatologists and uh, you see 60-80% of them complained about uh, abrupt changes in the organization and in the performance of the neonatal activities in the ward and in the outpatient settings. So this uh, is something that we need to include in the collateral damages of the COVID-19 epidemics. My final advice and my final takeaway is that this epidemic is an unprecedented challenge for all healthcare systems worldwide. Pediatricians and neonatologists need to know that the children, infants and neonates may be affected, but usually with less severity. However, all children may be carriers also for long times of the virus with gastrointestinal symptoms and orofecal transmission be very frequent and long lasting at all ages. Vertical transmission from mother to neonate can occur only occasionally and however cannot be discarded. Neonates usually show asymptomatic features or 
experience mild to moderate forms of the disease, even though no specific clinical picture attributable to COVID-19 has been consistently published so far. And the final consideration, since no specific treatment nor vaccine exists to date, breastfeeding, and I would dare to say lactoferrin, are highly recommended until something more specific will come available. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to receive questions later on. Thank you very much, Professor Manzoni. Uh, we will have all the questions and answer sessions after uh, the conclusion of the three uh, presentations. Okay. Uh, so I'll take it back now to Dr. Junay. Or we can start the second session. Uh, Dr. G is muted, I guess. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Thank you, Dr. Paolo Menzoni and Dr. Eamon. So uh, the next uh, session, we will start now with the first lecture, uh, and it is by Dr. Eamon Ramani himself. As usual, like last uh, few conferences, he's doing uh, the what's new in the neonatology, and then uh, we will uh, make up, uh, uh, we will see how a uh, few uh, very hot topics are going on. And then uh, during the course of the conference, we will discuss these in different uh, lectures. Dr. Eamon, all yours. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jene. Yeah, you can go ahead. I'm just trying to actually share my uh, screen with you guys. So just give me... Okay, so uh, just bear with me a little bit. Just uh, okay, great. So uh, thank you, Dr. Janet, again for the introduction. Um, as usual, uh, we uh, uh, started to do this a few years back uh, where uh, we put together a presentation of uh, all the presentations. So uh, uh, I look at the program and I um, look at the uh, topic and uh, I give you the, just the flavor of what we're gonna be seeing in the next few days uh, through the conference. So the topics I chose for this year is are very practical, and many of us uh, uh, have these uh, uh, practices in our NICUs, and I'm just going to be uh, giving you a few uh, slides about each of the practices that we, we do usually in our daily uh, care for new neonates, and uh, we examine the evidence uh, of these practices. So the first uh, uh, topic I'm going to talk about is untested use in NICU. I know Professor Manzoni uh, uh, published uh, extensively about the use of untested in the NICU. Uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of use has uh, been uh, uh, observed in the uh, neonatal um, practice. So we will examine if they're really helpful or harmful. Uh, the other uh, topic uh, we really rarely touch based on is the postpartum depression. It's going to be a full lecture about postpartum depression uh, by Dr. Lemia, and uh, we are um, uh, hopefully uh, shedding some light about this very common uh, um, illness that we uh, don't deal with as, uh, as much as we should. Uh, the other uh, topic in which we practice regularly now in delivery room is delayed cord planting. Uh, 
uh, I'm going to give you a, a flavor of the, uh, uh, the international guidelines and what's coming through the NRP 2020 in, regard, in this regard. And maybe uh, we will have some discussion about that. Uh, also, uh, common practice is that uh, we uh, worry about blood transfusion uh, in terms of uh, uh, association with necrotizing enterocolitis. So is there a true um, causation uh, with the factor that cell breath transfusion or just we were, uh, don't have a clear clarity about this issue? Also, analgesia is a, a, a well-used uh, 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 pharmacological uh, agent used in an NITU. Uh, I'm going to just examine the role of morphine in premature infants. Is it uh, helpful or harmful? Uh, again, a lot of babies we may evaluate for sepsis, and we use uh, C-reactive protein uh, in initial uh, evaluation. So I'm going to uh, talk about uh, if it's really useful to use TRP in the late onset study. Uh, so starting with antacids used in NICU, is it helpful or harmful? Uh, there is a really strict uh, indication to use antacids in the uh, neonatal uh, age, which is uh, erosive esophagitis or GIL. Other than that, there's really no established use for it. And there's a lot of studies that examine this role of antacids. Uh, pretty much all the studies agree that uh, there is really no change in the gastroesophageal reflux symptoms in patients who receive antacid because the babies don't have an acid reflux. They have a reflux, but there's not really acid reflux. Uh, and there's really no effects on apnea, bradycardia, or desaturation when we use antacid. Also, there's no evidence that uh, gastroesophageal reflux uh, and the use of antacid within that context alter the incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia uh, later on. So uh, we know that there is really a very limited role in uh, using antacid, but what's the harmful effect of antacid? Uh, there's a lot of studies also that show uh, there's association between infections and the use of antacid. Especially we worry about necrotizing enterocolitis because we uh, um, elevate the pH of the uh, stomach, which is the first defense mechanism against germs that the baby swallows. So we know that, uh, in, and this is really uh, a lot of publications by Dr. Manzoni about the association with sepsis and the use of antacid. Uh, bone fracture, because we used, uh, we changed, altered the uh, acid-base balance uh, by giving uh, uh, the uh, uh, H2 blocker or, uh, or proton pump inhibitor and there's an increased risk of allergy in a child. So what do we do to really reduce the use of uh, antacids in the uh, NICU? This is a, uh, a, uh, a work, a quality work that's uh, done at uh, Brigham and Women Children uh, at, uh, in Boston, and they evaluate an area between se September 2018 and uh, 2019, and uh, they look at this from the uh, multidisciplinary uh, team uh, approach. So uh, we know that the indications for using uh, antacid is very uh, small, and it's only about 20% of the total use of the prescribed uh, medication. Uh, so what do we do to decrease the unsubscribed or not un, uh, you know, uh, authorized use for antacid? Is we form a multidisciplinary team. Uh, we write guidelines, and we uh, inform all the team about the guidelines and then we implement the guidelines and we do staff education. When we do this, uh, actually when it's done this uh, project in, uh, in Brigham Women Children in uh, Boston, uh, they actually reduce the unindicated uh, use for uh, antacids uh, to almost zero. In the same time, they increase actually the uh, prescribed uh, uh, indication for uh, antacids to 100%. So moving to postpartum depression, and it's really, uh, this is an unknown or unnoticed um, uh, disease that uh, uh, we really should pay attention to. Uh, we know that the uh, babies, when they're born and they admit to NICU, the, both parents go under tremendous uh, amount of stress. 
and uh, they have, uh, if we com uh, compare the maternal uh, postpartum depression between the babies who are admitted to NICU and the babies who are not admit to NICU, we see that in general population, the percentage is about 19%. And this is also a poster that was presented in Hot Topic 2019 in the US. Uh, and uh, they, when we talk about the NICU population, population then the, that percentage of postpartum depression goes more, almost four times higher. Uh, also, there is a higher suicide risk uh, if we compare for, in postpartum er, uh, period uh, from 14% to almost 33%. So AAC recommend that all mothers be screened uh, for postpartum depression at the, uh, intervals after the uh, uh, birth, uh, two weeks, one month, two months, and four months. And that's during well child visit. Uh, also, postpartum depression only not affecting the mother, it's affecting the baby. So uh, we have a negative impact on both of cognitive and motor development of babies. Uh, and this is well established in the studies. Uh, and also increased exposure to stress uh, in ICU for the babies uh, affects overall uh, brain development uh, of the unfunctional ability to the baby. Uh, in addition to that, the, the baby uh, bonding to the mother is decreased when the mother has postpartum depression, which leads to less uh, response to the uh, uh, feeding cues that it affects the, uh, the breastfeeding. Okay, moving now to a very common practice, which is delayed cord clamping. Uh, that's really now routinely uh, practiced in uh, almost all our units. Uh, now, uh, I'm just gonna compare that to the cord milking, which is really not, not a lot of uh, solid information about cord milking at this point. So delayed cord clamping is recommended by American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, for 30 to 60 seconds for term and preterm infants who are not requiring immediate resuscitation at birth. Although it's a weak recommendation, but the impact is very high, so it's recommended by AAP and in the uh, NRP 7th edition. It's not only the NRP that uh, recommended this, but it's a lot of international bodies uh, recommend the use of delayed cord clamping or what we call physiological cord clamping and the period vary between 30 seconds to 60 seconds, but for most part, up to one minute. So what's the benefit of delayed cord clamping? Uh, we know that to maintain cardiac output, to maintain oxygenation, maintain body temperature, protect against rebound hypertension post asphyxia. And now there's some studies about uh, delayed cord clamping in the context of HIE uh, and the benefits of, of the delayed cord clamping. Uh, and that's in the works, like to find a way that to do daily core camping in the same time start resuscitation. Uh, also reduce the risk of pulmonary hypertension, uh, congenital asthmatic hernia in newborn, and improve the uh, motor development in babies. This is really a not new concept. Uh, you know, Aristotle, uh, 350 uh, BC, described what we know today as uh, cord milking where he described that nurses who were already skilled in squeezing the blood back out of the cord into the child's body. And uh, once the baby is previously seen as drained of blood comes to life again. So Aristotle really described the uh, uh, cord milking as we know today. So cord milking has some benefits, but it has uh, some also complications, uh, mainly due to the lack of cerebral autoregulation in the premature baby, especially where you uh, sudden increase or pulsation of blood into the brain can cause increased venous return, um, uh, caused by increased venous return uh, to the right side, into the PFO, into the aorta, and maybe it can precipitate IVH. So this is a poster that's uh, uh, also shown in uh, Hot Topics in 2019, uh, which uh, compared the uh, carotid artery blood pressure and carotid artery flow uh, in the babies who receive cord milking. And as you notice on the left side of the um, uh, left uh, side of the part of the slide, 
uh, you see that uh, the carotid artery blood pressure uh, goes in pulsation uh, according to the uh, time that we do the uh, cord milking. Where it's in a delicate cord clamping, there's a smooth and sustained uh, increase in the uh, uh, carotid artery blood flow, uh, not in the pulsatile form, which can actually be harmful to the premature brain. So from that point, the NRP7 physician recommendation is uh, to suggest against the routine use of cord milking for infants born less than 28 weeks. And trials are underway, and we should fill this gap by 2020, where we are uh, now due for the NRP8 to come out. So how does this uh, compare to the NLS? Uh, we know the NLS is the UK recommendation for the neonatal resuscitation. Uh, NLS say that an umbilical cord milking may prove alternative to delay cord clamping uh, in a baby who needs resuscitation. So they kind of hinting to our, uh, the benefit effects of cord milking, uh, but there's no enough evidence to recommend this as a routine measures. Um, and if you look at a uh, uh, study is that done in, in that regard, uh, this is a uh, PRIMO2 trial which uh, conducted in June 2017. It was supposed to be completed by December 2024 and uh, recruited uh, a lot of babies, 1,717, but then the majority were excluded. Uh, eventually, 540 babies were recruited and they randomized them to uh, either delay cord clamping or uh, cord milking. And this is non-inferiority. Uh, they uh, hypothesis is that cord milking is not inferior to the uh, cord delayed cord clamping. Uh, this study was had to be stopped actually by the board that approved it because of this finding. They found that uh, severe IVH is actually significantly higher in a cord uh, milking compared to the cord clamping, especially in the small babies, uh, 23 to 27 weeks gestation, where it is about four times. Uh, that uh, much of IVH happening in those smaller babies. So suggested that routine cord making should not be done less than 29 weeks gestation. Moving to the uh, back to RBCs and next association, uh, we know from this older study in 2012, uh, meta-analysis was done and showed uh, increased in the transfusion associated neck um, in those uh, when they compare these four studies. Uh, just an update uh, on a newer studies, which was published in 2018 um, in general prenatal medicine uh, and included a lot more studies that happened since that time, uh, which showed really no difference between the, uh, the incidence of neck uh, uh, among the babies who transfuse or not transfuse. Uh, so our understanding of the uh, association between transfusion and neck may be related to the anemia that's associated with uh, neck and uh, because of the effects on the tight junction disruption, which uh, increase the uh, passage of the uh, pathogen uh, from the mucosal surface into the lumina and then uh, it affects uh, the baby's uh, you know, causing infection. So maybe the association is because of the anemia, not because of blood, blood transfusion. So in conclusion of uh, that recent meta-analysis, uh, uh, there's really no association between the uh, RPC transfusion and neck. Uh, maybe the severity of anemia that causes the neck and interaction, maybe because of the components of the red cells, not the transfusion itself. Moving along to procedural pain, uh, we use a lot of uh, uh, analgesia for our painful uh, procedures in NITU. Um, and um, sometimes we use morphine as a, a way to, uh, to uh, reduce the pain. Uh, and we know that babies' response to pain when they're premature is different than when you're full term. So full term will give you facial expression, heart rate changes, or oxygen saturation changes. Uh, and if premature babies, because of prematurity of their brain, really there's not a lot of signs 
to give you indication of pain. So this uh, study was published in Lancet in 2018, compared the uh, um, morphine to uh, placebo in um, uh, the reactivity to pain uh, stimuli. So they look at the brain activity, they look at the reflex activity, and they found really there's no difference in the brain EEG uh, or EMG uh, for uh, the babies who receive placebo and versus morphine. So we know there's really no difference in reaction to pain uh, if you give morphine or if you give placebo. But what about the harmful effect of morphine? Uh, we know that all babies, especially premature babies, when they have morphine, they are, uh, have some side effects from morphine. So in terms of apnea, so the respiratory support uh, needs. Um, so uh, this is a very uh, known uh, fact that the baby has this, uh, sorry, I got this. Uh, So the conclusion of this study is that administration of oral morphine for non-ventilated babies, uh, they uh, have no uh, evidence of efficacy, but they have a harmful effect. So we should really not use oral morphine for uh, uh, analgesia uh, for uh, painful procedures. Last topic I wanna to touch based on is very practical for our NICUs where we use the reactive protein um, as uh, to guide our decision to initial evaluation for sepsis in the late onset sepsis in a free term infant. So this is a uh, published only in February 2020, uh, which is uh, looked at the uh, C-reactive protein. And they found actually the very low sensitivity of the uh, C-reactive protein is 0.62. Uh, sensitivity, uh, that 40% is really not sensitive and 60% uh, only sensitivity, finding that the CRP should not be used as a uh, determining factor for late onset sepsis uh, if we want to start antibiotics or not starting antibiotics. So uh, we should not be depending on it, even though we can um, look into the usefulness of CR reactive protein to guide our uh, evaluation of baby subsequent days into, in terms of how uh, uh, effective is our antibiotics treatment. So in summary, uh, answering the questions that we raised in the beginning, uh, antacids in an ICU, are they helpful or harmful? The answer is no benefit in most of the indications that they are used for with really proven harmful effects. So we really should limit the use of antacid in our NICU. Postpartum depression, are we paying attention? Do we, we need more focus about recognition and management? Maybe we should give questionnaires to the mothers when they come visit us uh, in two weeks, one month or more if the baby stay with us to uh, try to refer the mothers to appropriate services uh, for treatment of postpartum depression. Uh, delayed cord clamping versus cord milking. Uh, delayed cord clamping is beneficial. Cord milking can be harmful. So stay tuned for N2020 NRP and then an position. Uh, hopefully it will come soon. And in anemia transfusion, uh, is it confusion or causation? Uh, fact, RBC transfusion alone does not really cause an NEC. Uh, oral morphine for non-ventilated babies does not prove uh, to have provide anesthesia and will have harmful effects. And a CRP initial evaluation uh, for large onset sepsis does not help in aiding decision in who, to how, in who to treat. I hope that will give you a flavor of the coming days and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions if anybody have any questions. Thank you. So right now, uh, we go to the second uh, lecture of uh, Professor Manzoni to continue the topic of the uh, 
uh, hot topic of the hour is the COVID uh, and neonatal COVID specifically. So uh, what we are going to be discussing with uh, Dr. Manzun is going to touch base on very important uh, topic, which is how to deal with the babies who have mother have COVID, skin to skin contact and risk for COVID and the breastfeeding. Uh, Professor Manzun. Thank you. Thank you, Ayman. Can you see, can you see, can you, can you see the slides? Yes, yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. It's my second lecture. And now in this uh, short talk, I will uh, uh, show you once more, uh, which is the evidence on breastfeeding and which uh, could be the precautions for uh, skin to skin contact uh, related to COVID-19, uh, which is the evidence, because the evidence is uh, lacking, and I will uh, tell you how. This is my disclosure slide. This is the summary of the brief outline. We'll uh, start from a brief review of immunity in neonates and why breastfeeding is uh, such important. Uh, these are areas that uh, all of us know very well, but it's always useful to underline and update uh, this information. Then uh, we'll uh, take the point of the evidence existing about human milk and COVID-19. And finally, the same about uh, skin to skin content and COVID-19. First of all, we need to remind that the first months of life are the most critical ones in, uh, in the life of a neonate and uh, an infant because the only protection from infectious disorders derives from maternal or externally provided antibodies. And maternal antibodies can be provided through a term delivery thanks to the transplacental passage but mostly can be provided by breastfeeding. Duration of protection of inherited maternal antibodies can be precisely calculated and is 17 weeks. The more antibodies you receive, the higher you can be protected as a neonate. And in turn, infants who get infected, as an example by RSV, have received less maternal antibodies. Therefore, maternal vaccination in pregnancy might be a good option for some preventable diseases uh, that might be very severe in the first weeks of life, uh, such as influenza, pertussis, or RSV, RSV itself. And breastfeeding, therefore, is the current only possible solution to enable infants to receive robust intakes of antibodies and enable them to get defended. Keep in mind, and this was already shown in my previous talk, that hospitalization from bronchiolitis is strictly dependent on the breastfeeding with an inverse correlation. Uh, please note that babies breastfed can be protected by RSV, by severe RSV also, in the second semester of life, even though breastfeeding was stopped at six months. This means that the protection that we receive in the first months of life can span over the following months to a great extent. Also, I was already mentioning the lactoferrin included in human milk, but also supplemented externally or included in some specific formula milk, is able to protect infants in the second semester of life from respiratory infections. And we regard to COVID-19, this is even more interesting and I will show you later on why. So which is the evidence about human milk and COVID-19? We know that COVID-19 uh, is questioned to be potentially passed from a lactating manner or other to the infant through maternal milk. But the current answer is likely no. Is it, this is true and it's likely true because uh, 
routinely, no positive breast milk samples have been found in different reported cohorts, but few exceptions. These few exceptions, one of them coming from a German report and one other coming from an Italian report that I will show you later on, these exceptions look actually being like exceptions and not routine. The number of samples of human milk from COVID positive mothers that were negative overweigh by far the very limited number of samples that were positive. Therefore, in line with what above, we need to assume that the risk of a passage of COVID-19 through milk to the infant, thus determining COVID disease in the neonatal period, is very, very limited, if not actually existing. I was telling you about this very interesting study. This is in press in Frontier of Pediatrics and is a prospective multicenter observational study conducted in my town in Torino with the samples of human milk collected from 14 breastfeeding mothers who were positive for COVID-19. Search of viral RNA in human milk was performed by PCR all neonates underwent a clinical follow-up during the first month of life or until the occurrence of two sequential negative swaps. The results are extremely interesting. 13 out of 14 cases were negative in, as for regards to the search of COVID-19 in milk samples. Only in one case, the search was positive. All infants had a clinical outcome that was uneventful. All of them were breastfed, but one, and closely monitored in the first months of life. Four newborns, despite having uh, no COVID-19 in the milk, tested positive for COVID-19 and this occurred in the first 48 hours of life. Likely not attributable to human milk because it was negative. Therefore, we need to assume that the transmission of COVID-19 from this positive mother occurred horizontally through contact rather than through human milk. I'll Please note also that the clinical course of these four infants who became positive was uneventful, and all of them became negative within six weeks of life. Also, the baby who received positive human milk had an uneventful course. Therefore, even though this case still is limited, it's only 14 maternal infant diets, I think that this is strongly supporting the view that COVID-19 positive mothers can breastfeed because they do not expose their newborns to an additional risk of infection by breastfeeding. In line with this, we have another report published in the Journal of Human Lactation vouching conversely for a usefulness of breastfeeding in COVID-19 mothers and possibly COVID-19 infected babies. And this is because when we try to determine the uh, um, the existence of anti-COVID-19 IgA in the human milk samples, we have very interesting results because IgA specific for COVID-19 are actually there in human milk 
and could be just like in this case that it's described here, a potent tool to contrast the COVID-19 acquisition through human milk. So the two of these studies not only show that breastfeeding is generally safe, but also show that breastfeeding could, should be recommended because provides measurable antibodies against COVID-19. In addition, I was mentioning lactoferrin already in my previous talk, and I want to briefly take again this point because lactoferrin in vitro, as I was telling you earlier on, can target and inhibit a proteoglycan heparin sulfate proteoglycan HSPG that is critical for cell entry by the virus. This proteoglycan links to the virus and carries the virus to the high affinity receptor that is the very famous AC2 that is uh, critical for cell entry. Therefore, we need to assume that the lactoferrin in a human milk or externally provided might actually interfere with the contact and the cell entry of coronaviruses in the cells by blocking one of the receptors of this virus. And this is extremely important. And as a matter of fact, a clinical trial in Italy has already initiated, has already begun in Rome, and we are very much looking forward to the results of this study. Thanks to this background evidence, all societies but the Chinese one ultimately agreed on the opportunity to recommend breastfeeding and not to separate, unless specific limited situations, the mother from the infant, even though the mother is positive. As you see here, this is a document that we updated one month ago, USA, European Union, including Italy and France and UK, Brazil and many other societies, all of them agreed on this point. Only a situation is excluded. When a mother has a symptoms of severe COVID-19 infection and it's too sick to care for the newborn, then separation neonate mother is recommended and the use of express milk with no pasteurization is recommended. Please note also in this case it's not recommended to use formula milk. It is recommended to use expressed milk because in this way we limit the contact because the point is to limit the contact, not to avoid virtual transmission through the milk that is probably not existing. Let's go to skin-to-skin -skin contact. Uh, we published with uh, Professor Davanzo and Merwood an editorial in the American Journal of Perinatology last month Summarizing the existing evidence and the existing opinions, skin-to-skin skin skin contact after birth provides documented benefits on several areas, including breastfeeding enhancement, increased duration of breastfeeding, neonatal physiological well-being, and, and onset of a positive and good microbiome in the neonate. Since the evidence and the biological plausibility of a transmission through skin-to-skin -skin contact is lacking, at the moment, we have no tools and no evidence to recommend or to discard something regarding skin-to-skin -skin contact. Not only since 
Please note this last sentence. Since breastfeeding is recommended, why should we not recommend skin to skin contact? If the baby is placed at the nipple of the mother, uh, which is the difference uh, compared with placing the baby on the skin of the mother. So no data support an increased risk of uh, COVID-19 through skin contagion occurring during skin to skin. So at the moment uh, we feel like uh, reinforcing and strengthening the recommendation of the WHO that the skin to skin contact be practiced, including also in offspring from positive COVID-19 mothers. This is the editorial and once more, we uh, call, we draw your attention on the possible inconsistency between prohibiting skin to skin where at the same time we recommend breastfeeding. And as a matter of fact, all main uh, worldwide neonatal societies uh, agree on that. We are listing here a number of society, for example, the Canadian or the Spanish, uh, besides those that we showed earlier on, who actually recommend. The only exception remain the Chinese society, but I would strongly caution all attendees to follow recommendation of the Chinese societies who are extremely rigid and probably tailored on a healthcare system that is totally different from our healthcare system, both in the Western world or also in the Gulf region. This is another and the final example of safe perinatal management of neonates born to COVID-19 positive mothers in Italy, including breastfeeding and skin-to-skin -skin contact practices. This is a series of a very numerous bunch of neonates and mothers who were born in Piacenza. Piacenza was and still is one of the epicenter of the COVID pandemic in Italy. Some uh, hundreds of pregnant women were tested and followed up and all newborns coming from positive mothers were tested, followed up, but at the same time allowed to have immediate bonding, permanent ruminin and direct breastfeeding. This practice was safe and after a few months from this practice that occurred in March and April, we can safely say that no negative outcomes were related to immediate bonding and skin-to-skin -skin contact nor to ruminin or breastfeeding. With this in mind, my take home messages for this brief overview is that COVID-19 once more looks not associated with the clinical outcomes that can be worse in pregnancy or in the perinatal period compared to other ages or other patients. Some uncertainties remain pending, for example, about the possible higher rates of prematurity or intrauterine growth restriction, but this uh, does not affect the uh, core of the recommendations coming from this lecture. That is breastfeeding, skin-to-skin -skin contact and bonding after birth appear to be safe and even protective for the neonate once appropriate preventative measures to decrease the risk of uh, horizontal acquisition are adopted. Thank you very much once more for your attention. Thank you, Professor Manzoni, uh, uh, for a really great presentation and very informative. Uh, we will be open now for questions. Uh, I'm not sure how we're going to be receiving the questions. I hope I will get some guidance. Uh, 
Uh, but I'm sure Dr. Junaid will have the first question. So uh, go ahead, Dr. Junaid. Um, uh, Dr. Junaid, is there still mute uh, your uh, microphone? Okay, by the time Dr. Junaid prepared his question, uh, maybe I'll ask you Dr. Banzoni first question. Uh, now, you, you, as you mentioned, most of the uh, mothers are, even if they are COVID positive, they are asymptomatic. So uh, what should we do when we have to separate the baby and admit to an ICU for those babies? Uh, should we uh, isolate them and test them until they are negative and then we mix them with the other babies? Or should we testing the mother and wait until she is negative and then we test the babies? What should we do? Yeah, so uh, uh, thanks for the question, Ayman. The, the point is to first understand and assess uh, which is the clinical picture of the mother. If uh, the, ma the, the best possible solution is to keep the baby with the mother in rooming in, in a separate room, in an isolated room where the two of them stay together and uh, uh, share their virus if, uh, if this needs to happen, but do not share this virus with others. The only situation in which this uh, possibility needs to be discarded is uh, when the mother is uh, severely affected by, by COVID-19 with, as an example, a, a severe pneumonia, fever, high fever. So in this uh, case, the mother is kept separated and the baby is isolated in an isolation room in the NICU with uh, staff, dedicated staff, and with uh, uh, pathways that are uh, specific for the baby till the mother recovers and or till the tests are negative. This is what we do and, and I think that this is based on common good sense plus evidence-based medicine. Okay, uh, so uh, I have a, a couple of questions from the participants. Uh, first for uh, Dr. Uh, Eamon, uh, do you recommend delayed cord clamping in babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernia? Uh, there is, uh, I mean, we, we are following the AAP recommendation. The current recommendation is that uh, the exception for doing delayed cord clamping is that if you have a need for resuscitation. So for that, from that sense, uh, we don't do it, uh, but then I'm sure there's studies going on right now so looking at, for example, like, you know, intubating the babies uh, at the mother's side uh, without uh, cord, cutting the cord to give the benefit of the baby from the rebound from rehab attention. Uh, but uh, we, as our practice is no, we don't uh, do it at this time because AAP recommends only delay cord clamping for babies who do not need resuscitation. Okay. Uh, for uh, Professor Manzuni, uh, there's a couple of questions about the discharge planning. That if the baby is uh, shedding uh, the virus for one month, so how we can tackle with that? So, Professor Manzuni, can you elaborate? And uh, there are three, four questions uh, with the same, uh, uh, same uh, concept. That, uh, yeah. yeah, I know. This is an issue, and uh, we need to track the COVID-19 statues uh, over the weeks. As a matter of fact, in Italy, we perform uh, swabs uh, to the neonate uh, at birth, at three days of life, at one week, at 14 days, and at one month of life, is tests remain positive. But if we have two consecutive negative tests, that's all, we uh, consider this baby as cleared from uh, positivity. Obviously, uh, our approach is that if the baby is uh, asymptomatic or sta and or stable, is, if he's doing well and if the mother is doing well, we do not keep the baby in the unit as uh, uh, an admission. 
waiting for negativity of the swab. We discharge the baby, we send him home with the mother and uh, the tests will be performed by uh, outpatient services that are connected with us over the following weeks. Okay, okay. Uh, there's uh, two more questions for you and then two more questions for Dr. Eamon. The first question, uh, Dr. Manzoni, that what is the minimum precaution you recommend, uh, although you said in your, lect in your second talk, uh, uh, for the breastfeeding, if the mother is not symptomatic, okay, and uh, is, but is the COVID positive. This is the first and the second one that if many times we don't know the status of the mother, so baby born to the, that mother, uh, we have to do the COVID uh, test for all of them or uh, be specific. So these two questions for you, Dr. Yeah. Oh, The first one, breastfeeding COVID-19 positive mother, she can breastfeed, breastfeed. she is recommended to breastfeed, but she needs first to clean her nipple uh, frequently. And second, I advise, I suggest to use a mask, a surgical mask to decrease aerosolization passage from the mother to the neonate, even though this is a, a a little hard for mothers not to kiss their baby, but until a positivity is there, this is something that can be recommendable and understandable. And um, the second was, uh, sorry, if I, can you remind me the second question? The, the second question is, uh, is, is about the, uh, how you will uh, consider that uh, all the babies who deliver with the mother, which we don't know ah, okay. the COVID status. Yes. So how yes. you uh, decide which baby you have to do it? Yeah, no, we, uh, we start from the mothers. So now it is uh, compulsory and it's uh, routinely done that the mothers delivering undergo a COVID test. So in a few hours, usually during labor, we know the COVID status of the mother. Okay. So we know very well already at birth how to manage the baby. If uh, we still don't know the result of the maternal test, okay. we behave looking at the clinical picture rather than at positivity or negativity. If the mother is doing well, uh, does not report significant uh, close contact with positive uh, patients and has no symptoms, we consider her negative until we do not receive a positive test. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Eman, there is a question uh, from the participant that what is the best time to do the CRP and follow up CRP in a suspected uh, neonatal sepsis? So uh, this study uh, looked at the value of CRP is an initial evaluation of late onset sepsis. So uh, there's still a value of using CRP for the early onset sepsis. And uh, Professor Manzoni and I, in the last conference we got together in uh, Sharjah, there was a heated debate about the CRP value. Is it? Above 10, we consider it abnormal. Is it uh, higher than this? Is it above three? So uh, this study is basically looked at the late onset sepsis. So late onset sepsis, what they say is that do not use the CRP value as an indication to start antibiotics. So if, uh, you know, for example, if it's, uh, if it's sensitivity is only 60%, and you taking the CRP value as an indication to start or not to start? No, you have to start based on a clinical graph, not based on a CRP value. Uh, the other question, uh, Eamon, for you uh, from the participant, that for the late onset sepsis, how you see uh, the utilization or to doing the procalcitonin instead of a CRP? Do you have any uh, comment on that? Yeah, if, if you have it available to your hospital, it's very good. Uh, it's really, it's, there's no established uh, cutoff 
for the babies in the first few days of life. But beyond that, uh, there's a value for procalcinate if you have it. And uh, if it's available to you, it's uh, more sensitive than a TRC. Okay. Now, the, the last thing is that because uh, you showed that study, uh, PREMOT uh, trial 2. Uh, so, one of the participants said that there is a one study which uh, also published recently, uh, but uh, we, I, I don't have the reference. And he said that uh, he or she said that uh, they recommend still the cord milking. So, what, what, what is your practice in your unit? Okay, so we don't do cord milking uh, at any gestational age because there's not enough evidence to support the routine use as per an RP. NLS uh, showed that uh, there is a maybe some benefit to using uh, cord milking if in the cases that need resuscitation. But either the NRP or the NLS, both of them saying that it really should not be the used under you can touch about 29 weeks or 27 weeks, you'll be more careful uh, because of the risk of IVH. I think the risk of IVH is real for a small baby because it's a pulsatized flow when you do the cord milking. So if you want to use it for a, a full-term baby, uh, it's not recommended uh, routinely because there's not enough evidence. Uh, maybe in RP 2020, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Davis will update us on the new recommendation in that regard in the future and in the next uh, couple of days. Uh, but there's no enough uh, recommendation from the NRP. Okay. So the last question uh, for uh, Professor Manzuni again. Uh, is there any uh, cross reaction or the protection if we get the flu vaccine from the COVID? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we... Of course, uh, there is no cross protection in, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, in a literal uh, meaning. However, a very nice uh, study and a very nice editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine one month ago from uh, Professor Mantovan, uh, is one of the leading uh, scientists from the Italian health system. Um, he's an immunologist and provided evidence and background information supporting the view that children may be more protected towards COVID-19 because they undergo frequent and routine vaccinations because their immune system would be trained to, re to react against pathogens. And this has a, a biological plausibility because uh, the interleukin pathways and the toll like receptors uh, interaction might be already such efficaciously trained that they could react in a better way also to viruses or agents which have not been vaccinated for. So this is a very interesting theory that needs to be demonstrated in the real life, but pending this background evidence, I would, and I actually am strongly recommending vaccination for flu for all children, just like the Italian health system is doing, because this might provide a collateral positive effect. And uh, the extent of this effect is not measurable, but the, uh, the options behind that are, in my, in my opinion, solid enough to support this view. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Manzuni. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ayman Rahmani. Uh, we will conclude this first session, uh, very informative, very latest uh, thing. And hopefully you will join, uh, both of you join in uh, other sessions. So for the participants, uh, we will start uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, UAE time. So like 20 minutes from now to start the another uh, very informative uh, session on uh, respiratory or respirology of the, for the new needs. 
We will see you in uh, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you again, Eman, and thank you, Manzoni. Thank you. Great talk. Thank, thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Best regards to all of you. Thanks Bye. a lot. Thank you. Bye.